So next speaker is Aditi, she's from uh, Stanford. And uh, today she's going to talk about uh, certified defenses against adversarial examples. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Aditi, I'm a grad student at Stanford. And today I'm going to be talking about some of our recent work on certified defenses against adversarial examples. Uh, this is joint work with Jacob Steinhardt and my advisor Percy Liang at Stanford. Okay, so machine learning, as we all know, is successful on several tasks. I don't think I need to elaborate too much on this at this venue. Uh, but as we try to use machine learning in the real world and deploy it in different environments, like how does machine learning hold up in an adverse environment? So unfortunately, a lot of recent work has shown that machine learning classifiers indeed fail catastrophically when the adversary comes into the picture. And suppose an adversary provides input to the classifiers, the classifiers perform really badly. So in this pretty evil looking smiley, it refers to the advisor and the rest of, oh, sorry, attacker. That was an honest mistake. Um, that was an honest mistake. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so this uh, represents the attacker in the rest of the talk. And we're seeing what happens when we pitch the attacker against uh, machine learning. And a lot of recent work has shown that, in fact, the attacker wins. And the growing list of applications is pretty depressing where the attacker wins. So just a few representative examples. So if you have an adversary fighting with a facial recognition system, uh, by picking suitably colored glasses, like people show that you can cause the machine learning classifier to think you're someone completely different. So if you, in particular, if you're trying to evade a system that you know, uses your face to recognize something, you can easily impersonate someone else. And self-driving cars, so if we walk on the road and we see two stop signs that look like this, like we would just think of them as some innocuous stickers. But this is pretty dangerous because a car can somehow think of these as speed limit signs, and this is really bad when an adversary is trying to cause accidents. So not just vision, in fact, like these examples exist for various other settings. For example, people have shown in this hidden voice commands paper that uh, if you have a mobile system that uses your voice to do some particular actions by adding something that basically sounds like noise, you can f cause your phone to do something malicious. You can also fool malware detection systems while still you know, retaining your malware functionality. You can just evade the classifier that tries to detect. Okay. So why is it so difficult to defend against adversaries? So one obvious challenge is no one knows what's an adversarial example. There's no formal definition. So philosophically, we can think of it as you know, an example that is very close to natural images, and we as humans don't get fooled. Like For example, if someone wears glasses, we know it's the same person. If there are stickers on a stop sign, we know we just need to ignore them. But somehow the machine learning model needs to figure out what are these things that it has to ignore. So there's that one obvious challenge. So even if we make the problem simpler, and say that we formalize what is an adversarial example and we fix the adversary model, which means we fix what an adversary can do to harm you, does the problem become any easier? Unfortunately, the adversaries still seem to win. So as a community, we seem to be uh, interested in this adversary model where, you know, like, let's say we denote the natural inputs as x in some d-dimensional space. So the adversarial input is basically an input where the adversary can come and change each uh, feature, or in like case of images, each pixel by a small quantity epsilon, and then feed this perturbed input to your classifier. Uh, just to introduce some notation that I'll use later, we can basically think of this epsilon ball around which an adversary is allowed to pick examples. And these are very close. I mean, epsilon is really small. So basically, these adversarial examples are also very close, in some sense, to the natural inputs. And we seem to have fixed L infinity as a natural notion. Because you know you want like if you change each pixel by a small quantity, you don't want your classifier to think it's something different. So I guess uh, any talk on adversarial example is incomplete without this famous panda picture here. Um, so here is an input to the classifier, which like several state of the art classifiers will predict it to be correctly as a panda. But when we add really, really small noise to each pixel, like 0 0.007 is epsilon here, and we get this new adversarial image. And you know, like I don't even see a difference between these two images, but uh, state-of-the-art classifiers think that this is now a given. So I guess Ian is going to be talking about some of this stuff uh, later in the day. But basically, this is an example to show where you know, in this formal adversary model, we can fold the classifier. And this is particularly surprising, because like, humans can't even distinguish these two images. OK, so, so the community seems to be interested in the L-infinity adversarial model. And like, so where do things stand as of now, once we fix this? 
So these were first discovered in 2014 that you know there are these adversarial examples that can fool the classifier through small changes. And in 2015, Ian and others came up with um, an easy attack called the fast gradient sign method to generate these adversarial examples. And in the same paper, they also came up with a defense, like which they call adversarial training, that you know can uh, that seems to work against this like particular fast gradient sign attack that they proposed. And uh, after a few months, like there was distillation as another defense that was proposed, and it seemed to be working well against a couple of attacks that were existing at that time. However, a few months later, Carlini and Wagner showed that you know, distillation is not really secure. They came up with a new attack that um, basically can, can evade this uh, distillation defense. And in 2017, like, there's been some more work to show that, in fact, both these two proposed defenses of adversarial training against fast gradient sign method, as well as distillation, uh, do not really fundamentally improve the security. They just make it harder to find adversarial examples. So if you have stronger attacks, you can easily beat these defenses. Another line of work that people tried is to say, can you detect when an adversary is trying to fool you? So can I see that this is an input that's not natural, but an adversary has you know, provided? And hence, I'll just abstain from making any uh, prediction and like avoid any catastrophic errors. Um, and some of the recent work, Carlin and Wagner again showed that like whatever existing detection strategies existed, they all fail. They have attacks that can break all of them. Uh, so disclaimer, this is like in no way an exhaustive list of the work that's been done, but I just picked examples to show sort of the dynamic that goes on. Uh, and so finally now we have another um, defense that's been proposed recently, and is it secure, or like will this trend continue, and in a few months or maybe a year, uh, Carlini and Wagner might just break this one again. Um, <laughs> Okay, so basically the sort of game between attacks and defenses uh, sort of now looks like this, where you know each one comes up with new attacks and defenses, they keep beating each other. So why did like so why are things like in this cat and mouse game? So one thing is all the proposed defenses are heuristic. And this is really bad when you're trying to you know, interact with adversaries because they have the incentive to find out cases where heuristics fail and exploit these vulnerabilities. And uh, another thing is like when you propose a defense, typically it seems to be that you know you evaluated on attacks that exist at the time, and we have no sort of guarantee on what happens against future attacks. And in particular, it's as we saw earlier, like future attacks indeed break all these defenses quite often. So our main motivation in uh, in our work is to try and break this arms race that seems to be going on between attacks and defenses. And what one would need to do to break this arms race is basically, uh, you know, come up with defenses which have provable robustness. So I want to emphasize that, like, we are using provable robustness as, a, as you know, a way to break this arms race. So once you have uh, a proof, you have no holes in your system that the adversary can exploit. And in particular, you want to keep an eye for all attacks because you want to keep in mind that future attacks are going to get stronger. So we want to guarantee that this thing would perform against like all possible attacks, even attacks in the future. And hopefully by doing this, we can you know, give the trophy to the machine learning and like the trophy is to stay. So I hope people are, believe me, that it's important to have probable robustness so that we can break this arms race that goes on between attacks and defenses. Uh, so now I'll like, be a little more concrete about what it would mean to be probably robust. So basically what that would mean is you're trying to design some function which depends on the input that you've Supply to the classifier as well as the network weights. And we want this function to have some properties. First thing, as I said, you want to be certified uh, that, you know, uh, you want to be certified against all attacks. So you don't want to look at only existing attacks. You want to think about all possible attacks that could happen within like this L infinity adversarial model. So in particular, you want to guarantee sort of saying, like, you know, if this function is small, then like all attacks in the L infinity ball, like they're gonna fail, um, they're gonna fail on your input. You also want it to be computationally efficient because you're going to be testing over a large number of you know, input images, for example, and you want to be able to do this quickly. Also, as we saw, like we, there is a need to make classifiers more robust. So like, you know, we also want to design this function so that uh, we can use it to get a training objective so that we can minimize this function and hence have provable robustness. So what would that mean? We want things like it has to be differentiable so that it fits easily into our current training framework, and you want to be able to make quick updates in each step. So these are some of the properties that we want you know, any um, 
like this, this like you want to design a function that has these properties and like there could be several approaches that one could take to do this and in our work we took the approach of convex relaxations and i'll try to speak about that now so by convex relaxation i mean like we expressed this function d star as the optimum of a convex program so in this talk i'll talk about how we could do this for uh, two layer neural networks and for ease in presentation, I focus on the case of binary classification, where like you can easily express the, express the label as just the sign of some function f, and ReLU networks. So what I present today uh, can be easily extended to multi-classes and like more general networks. But if you want to look at more sorry more gen um, general activations, if you want to look at bigger networks, we have a slightly different approach, and I'm happy to chat about that offline later. So just to remind people of you know, what the setting is, so you have x, which is an uncorrupted input, and the label that the classifier gives is the sign of x, and let's say the label is right. Sorry, yeah. Um, so the adversary wants to pick an, ad um, an adversarial example, x tilde, within this allowed ball, such that it changes the label, so the signs are different. So it's easier to think of the function of, uh, in, uh, as like, you know, how, how much it changes. So now, in order to, like, if you want to say that um, the sign cannot be changed, then what we can say is that the change of function is small relative to f of x, then f of x still that cannot take a different sign. I'm being very informal here, like, all these arguments can be made precise, and um, so the main idea is to bound how much a function can change by bonding the gradient of f is within this L infinity ball. So we're basically saying, I mean, so when, when it's the L infinity ball, it, it turns out that the right norm to use is the L1 norm, and we're trying to bound how much, how large is the L1 norm within the L infinity ball, and you're saying that if this value is small, that means the gradient is small and the function doesn't change enough, and the adversary cannot fool you. In the interest of time, I'm going to like skim through this pretty quickly. Um, so if we want to express this expression for the gradient for two-layer networks, it turns out it, it depends on basically which set of values are active in your hidden, let, in your hidden layer. And, so, and which set of values could be active in B epsilon of x depends on the input x and the weights of the classifier. But that could be hard to optimize. And so what we say is like relax the problem and instead optimize over a larger set. So optimize over all possible combination of values. And so the nice thing is now we've made it only a function of the weights. So we only need to compute it once and not for every input. And we've also retained the fact that it's an upper bound because we're optimizing over a larger set. And uh, so for two-layer networks, it turns out that we can write this as a non-convex quadratic program. And there are standard ways that we can deal with quadratic programs by relaxing it to be a convex semi-definite program. So in this way, we can show how this d star function can be written as the optimum of a convex program. So I started the talk with motivation about like what are the properties that we would need, and let's just quickly check that this convex relaxation actually satisfies all of them. So first thing is I wanted to be certified against all attacks in this model, and in each step we have only expanded the space over which we are trying to bound the maximum, therefore we are only getting an upper bound, which means that we have a guarantee that no attack can do, um, like this value is an upper bound and the damage an adversary can do. So this one is, uh, is maintained. The next thing is to be computationally efficient. So SDP, uh, the nice thing is you can optimize it only once. And then it's also like there are nice off-the-shelf optimizers to optimize this efficiently. And it's easy to incorporate it into training. Um, the dual of this SDP turns out to give a nice differentiable objective. I'm sorry, I can't give more details right now. And most importantly, all this can be implemented in just a few lines of code in TensorFlow. And now I'll quickly go to results. OK, um, sorry. So what, like, one can think of other simple ways of you know, bounding the change in function value. And like, we have some things in terms of like, the spectral norm or the Frobenius norm. And on MNIST, it seems like, OK, so the x-axis basically shows the epsilon, that is the ball over which the adversary can find examples. Oops. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the dashed line is the adversary, which seems to be most successful right now, which is the gradient descent iterative attack. And um, yeah, so at, at around point one, it gets like, it basically can screw all your examples, and our bound also says that. It's always an upper bound of the damage this attack can do. In particular, there could be attacks in between this, you know, this dashed line and the blue line, which we have not yet found. 
and like we try to train uh, this network against this, I mean a network against this objective for MNIST. So one thing to first note is that the SDP bound, uh, which is a guarantee on any attack, is decreasing compared to the previous bound, previous graph. And interestingly, the performance of the gradient descent adversary also reduces. So note that you have not explicitly regularized against this particular attack, but it still seems like, at, say, for example, at epsilon equal to 0.1, you have brought the accuracy down to just 20% in terms of, I mean, like the adversary succeeds only on 20% of the examples. And the nice thing is that we, this uh, blue line here gives an upper bound, which says that any attack on this network in the future in this same adversary model cannot do better than 45% at epsilon equal to 0.1. So there's no attack that can like get lower than 45% at epsilon equal to 0.1. So these numbers are like still preliminary, but I think uh, we're just trying to show that you can actually get provable robustness by and efficiently optimize it as well. Just to compare it against uh, another defense that seems to work right now, it seems like um, so our bound shows a large gap between what uh, success, what the adversary currently has, and what could be done. So in, it's possible that there are attacks that can you know that can achieve better performance against like other trained networks, but in our network the gap is small, and we have a better upper bound on the guarantee of an attack. Um, so to conclude. The main motivation is to try to break the arms race between attacks and defenses by having provable security. And, and I, we sp I mean, we spoke about how convex relaxations are a promising approach. And two-layer networks are nice because they allow us to bond gradients. And for general networks, we have a different way where we can reduce this to a search problem over quadratic constraints and use the same SDP approach again. And uh, there, there are some other approaches for provable security. I don't have time to speak much, but like there's other cool work from Stanford that also tries to do the same thing, but they have different trade-offs. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Time for we have time for one uh, quick question. The proposed system you um, uh, propose here are um, robust against the pro uh, poisoning attack because the adversary can easily modify the training parameter or decision model. Yeah, so we're only focusing on attacks where you know it happens only at test time. So data poisoning attacks are another, there's a bunch of interesting work on how you can try to be robust against training attacks. We're not looking at that in this. We assume that the training data is good. All right, we can uh, thanks Aditi again. Thank you.